So y'all, we're going to be continuing on our series on honor. We're going to be continuing. This is going to be our last installment on honor. So pro praise God, we made some progress. Amen. It's going to be. Amen. We made some progress. So we're going to be continuing. And there's a scripture that I really love. There's a scripture that says, he says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David was glad because he understood that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So David wasn't just going to the house of God to be a doorkeeper. He was going to get filled up with the word of God. Amen. He wasn't only going to pour out in service, but he was going to get filled up. Amen. And we got to take notice to that principle. When we come into the house of God, we don't come just to we don't come just to pour out in service but we also come to be filled because anytime you pour out without being filled you're gonna find yourself empty and unfruitful and anytime you come and get filled up but you forget to pour out somewhere you are also gonna find yourself fruitless and useless amen because what good is it to have a bunch of money stacked up in the account but you don't have no access to it and you can't use it Amen. All it's going to do is drive your stress level up to just watch it and you can't never use it. Amen. You're going to make getting money useless. <laughs> hey, God. So glory, we got we to gotta be mindful. There's a principle there that David applied and we got to apply that same principle to have that same fruit of gladness that he had. He had a fruit of gladness and I believe that's due to two important principles. And we're going to talk about it tonight. The first one is the law of harvest. Amen. This law exists in all of creation. You got to reap in order to sow. You got to give in order to receive. Amen? Amen. It's giving out and taking in. Somebody say the law of harvest. The law of harvest. And the law also of oneness. So somebody say the law of oneness. The law of oneness. Now that law of harvest again is, I want y'all to remember this one. It's receiving and responding. I want y'all to remember that concept because we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight. Receiving and responding. There's a little bit of a law of reciprocity going on there. But in the law of oneness, this is a law that says that all things are created for your benefit and created with you in mind. All things are working together for your good. God designed all things to work in harmony for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. Yeah. There's a scripture that says it like this, too. Let me let me. He says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or present or future, all things are yours. Uh -huh. Everything was designed to work in harmony with you. Amen. I like how there's a book that says it like this. The tree is in the seed and the, the seed is in the tree. Amen. The child is in the parent and the parent is in the child. We are in the earth and the earth is in us. Amen. We are in the wind and the wind is within us. We are in God and God is in us. Amen. There's a little bit of a law of oneness there. And this, this law applies throughout all creation. And this is important. Why? This is important to understand because when you understand that all things are ultimately connected to you, you're going to begin to receive it different and respond to it different. And this is going to help us in our application of honor. Amen. When you understand that all things are ultimately connected to you, you're not going to only want to just take from it, but you're going to also want to give back to it as well. Anything that's connected to you, if you're back connected to you, you're not just going to deplenish it. You're going to want to replenish it as well because you understand that it's a part of you. So this is going to help us in our honor because it's for you. This is a tool that God has given for your benefit. All right. And so we're going to look at an example of a group of people who refuse to receive and respond to the glory of God. All right. So we don't ever become this way. Amen. We're going to look at it and we're going to look at it good. So we never become this because as Hebrews, we are honorable people. Yeah. Amen. Are we not an honorable people? Yeah. Yeah. We are. We got to get rid of that term of the stiff neck Israel. We are an honorable people. Yeah. Hey, God. And so we're going to be looking at our main scripture, which is Mark 6, verse 1 through 6. And it says like this, and it says, He went 
out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished. The Bible says they were astonished. They didn't know what to say. And they said, from whence hath this man these things, and what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? And the Bible says that they were offended. Now, instead of, instead of receiving the word and rejoicing in the glory of the word, they became offended. They rejected the word. They refused to receive it, and they refused to respond to the glory of God. They refused to give him a proper response for everything that he was trying to show them. And so Jesus has a response for them. He says, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. He said, everybody going understand the value of the prophet except for his own people sometimes. It's the saddest thing. He said, except for your own people, they're the last ones to notice. And because it is, because it is, the Bible says he could there do no mighty work. He, not that he didn't want to do no mighty work. He, he, he was hindered by the dishonor. He was hindered by the unbelief. And he said, he says he marveled at their unbelief. But we're going to be focusing on that part where he says a prophet is without honor except among his own. A prophet is not without honor except amongst his own. Amen? Amen. So we're going to be talking about honor and value. Lord God, we thank you for this word. Father God, we pray that this word would take deep root in our hearts, Father God. And we pray that it would bear fruit, Father God, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Father God, in your own time, I know you're going to water the seed, but God, we pray that you would plant it deep on tonight. We thank you for your word, Father. We pray that you would bless our time in your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be talking about honor and value tonight, y'all. Last time we talked about perceiving value, but today we're going to be talking about honor and value. And the last... Three times I was up here as we've been talking on this series. The first time I was up here, we talked about being so focused on man that you actually miss God. Being so focused on humanity that you actually miss divinity. And that's kind of underlining this whole series, amen? The second time I was up here, we talked about a spirit of offense and how if you don't operate in a spirit of love, you're going to be susceptible to a spirit of offense. The Bible said it was offended, amen? Also, the last time I was up here, we talked about unbelief and how unbelief can actually, actually, can actually blind you from seeing reality as it is. Yes, sir. All right? Jesus, the Bible says Jesus marveled at their unbelief. He, yeah. he was like, man, this is another level, all right? And so these are three things that are going to block you from honoring. Amen? Mm. So now we have to ask the question, then what is honor? We didn't talk about all this, but now what is actually is honor, how do we apply it, and why is it important? I'm glad y'all asked that question. I'm glad y'all finally asked me that question. What is honor? Come on. Amen? Amen? Glory, because if we don't know what honor is, then how can we say that we honored? How can we say that we've ever honored before if we don't know what it is? And this is important because God has given us a promise as believers. He says, those that honor me will I honor. That's a pro for those who love to hang on to the promises of God. He said, if you honor me, I am going to honor you. That is my word. And he says, for those who despise me, I'm going to lightly esteem. So it should be like, oh, my God, then what is honor? I need to figure out what is honor because this thing is important to God. All right. And it's simple. It's not a hard thing. This word honor in the Hebrew is kavad. It's that word kavod, and it means a weight. Not in like be patient, but in heavy. It's a weight. Yeah. It's a respect or a reverence which belongs or is shown to one with rank or position of value. It's the weight which is attached to a person or a thing by, person, by, by reason of rank, value, and office which a person or a thing holds. Now, the simple way to say this is that Honor is just a proper response to the value that God has placed in your life. That's simple. It's just a proper response to value. That's all honor is, is perceiving somebody's value accurately and then responding accordingly. Amen? Amen. That's all it is. Simple. 
But let me tell you what honor is not, because a lot of times we think honor is this tool to keep people suppressed. And that's why it makes it hard to talk about. People get icky when you talk about honor sometimes because they think it's a tool of suppression. They think it's a tool to keep people in subjection. And that's not it at all, y'all. Honor is actually a tool to plug you to power and speed ramp your growth. All right? That's what honor is, if we look at it as it is. So we got to begin to redefine what is honor. All right? But what is not is not a tool of suppression. Amen? It's not just for leadership. That's not what honor is. No. The Bible says, honor all men. Let's look at it. The Bible says, honor all men. Love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So the Bible is telling us, respond to the value that God has placed in every man. Respond to them according to their value. The Bible says, give honor where it is due. Wherever yeah. honor is due, give a response to value wherever you see it. Yeah, yeah. That's all he's saying. That's all he's saying. But does that mean treat everybody the same? Does that mean give everybody the same response? No. no. That's not what that means. Two different roles require two different responses. You don't talk to the father the same way you talk to the child. They both hold two different weights in the household. Amen? So you got to give them a proper response according to their value. The CEO don't get paid the same amount as the person holding the mom. They both have two different values within the company. Amen? And you have to respond to each of them according to their value. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. But the Bible says honor all men, but what about women? Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> what does it say in, in Peter 3, verse 7? He says, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And the fact that y'all are both joint heirs together. So what is he saying? He's saying dwell with her according to knowledge and respond to her according to the value that God has placed in her. Understanding that she is the more delicate flower. You yes. understand? She needs to be protected. Yes. She Come needs on. to be watered. Yes. You don't respond to her according to your value. You, you a warrior. You built to go out there and fight. That's the value that God has placed in you. But don't respond to her like that. You understand? Understanding that y'all are joint heirs together, respond to her according to the value that I placed in her. She's a nurturer. Don't put her in the boxing ring with a whole man. You understand what I'm saying? I've created her for a different purpose. And respond to her according to her value. Respond to her according, deal with her in a way that reflects what I placed inside of her. That's some good marriage advice. Me being married, if I get, that's some good marriage advice. Because God is telling us right here, there's something that he placed on the inside. In order to tap into it, though, you're going to have to respond to it. Yes, there's a queen deep inside of there. Come on, mom. Don't Come respond right. to her attitude, but respond to what I said she is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Respond to every person according as I had said that they are. Amen? Amen? Respond to them according to their value, not according to their attitude. <laughs> hey, this is what the Bible say. Peter giving us some marriage advice. Because listen, if you, I've been married, so you, you, you start responding to her attitude, her attitude going to respond back to you. Yes, come on, come on. Yes, come on. <laughs> they say, they got a saying, they say, if you talk crazy, then crazy going to talk back. <laughs> so you better be careful because what you respond to is what's going to respond to you. Amen. Amen? So you got to start choosing your responses wisely. Good, Amen? Is that making sense? Makes sense. Yes, because, again, whatever you respond to is what's going to respond to you. So do you want a response out of my flesh, or do you want a response from the Spirit of God living inside of me? Amen. You got to begin to look at, you got to re re begin to look for God in everything. Yes, Amen? Sir. Because if you find God in everything and you begin to talk to the God in everything, then God is going to begin to respond to you. Amen? Yeah. All right. Thank you so you got to pick your responses wisely because you don't want a response. from Some things in life don't even warrant a response. Yeah, yeah. The proper response to some things in life is no response at all. No response. Just don't give it no response because whatever you respond to can control you. 
Whatever, whatever you respond to, whatever can move you, whatever can pull a response out of you, can control you. Whatever moves you, can. if I can move this bottle of water, that's because I can control it. You got to stop letting things move you. You got to stop letting things move you so easy. Not responding to people's flesh, but responding to the spirit of God. I love this. When Peter walked on the water, he, was, he, he began to respond to what Jesus said. And so he hopped out of the boat and he started to walk on the water. But then he began to respond to the waves. And then the waves was able to consume him because whatever you respond to is what can now engage with you. If somebody called my phone and I don't pick up and I don't respond, they can't engage with me. <laughs> Simple and plain. If you text me and I don't text back, you can't engage no more. We got to learn the importance of our response because if we just resist some things in life, they can't even, they can't even engage with us. Amen? So we got to learn the power of our response. We got to stop responding to what our situation is saying. We got to stop responding to what people are saying. We got to stop responding to what our bank account is saying sometimes. Amen? And we got to ask ourselves, God, what are you saying? I hear what they saying, but God, what are you saying through them? What are you trying to tell me? That's when you're going to really get some answers. When you, yeah, stop, yeah. when you stop responding to people and begin to respond to God, because God is the one looking for the response. Yes, sir. God is looking for a response, amen? And if God says you're blessed and highly favored and the devil says you curse, why are you going to respond to what the devil said? Why do you let the devil's word hold more weight than God's Come word? On. You understand that's disrespectful to God. When you give a response to your situation over my word, you saying that your situation hold more weight than my word. That's disrespectful. God is like, man, that is disrespectful to me. You give your response to me because I'm the one in control. Yeah, you fighting with the hands, but don't forget the head is controlling the hands. I'm the one in control. Don't forget to respond to my glory. And man, some things you got to just not respond to. And I'm not saying... So don't respond to them bill collectors and they ain't going to come pick up your stuff. Nah. <laughs> what I'm saying is, even if they do come pick up your stuff, if you don't let that move you, God can go get it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm talking from testimony. Yeah, yeah, come on. You understand what I'm saying? Don't let things move you. Don't let things pull you out of where you're supposed to be. Woo. Amen? But even if you have to respond, some, in some situations you got to respond to. Like, you got to respond like Jesus. Jesus was like, I don't got no my own response, but let me tell you what God said. It is written. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. It is written. Say, I don't care what all you're saying, but it is written. Let me tell you what God said. And he was, look, he was being a little sassy with him too because he is God. But he was trying to teach us something. Amen. Not to, not to have our own response. Sometimes we're quick to have our own response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how the man of God went to the altar and he laid out the paperwork and he said, God, this is what the enemies are saying. I don't have no response. You respond to them. And God took care of the business, amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God waiting for you to, to respond to him. He go to the valley of the dry bones, he say, son of man, what you think? The situation's saying that they ain't going to live again. Can they live again? He said, God, you know. I don't know nothing but Christ and him crucified. That's all I know. Let God be true and every man be a liar. Come on. God, what do you say? That's how we got to be sometimes. We got to stop having our own response and let God respond on our behalf. Amen? Whatever you refuse to give a response to in life, God is going to refuse to give you. God cannot give you what you refuse to give a proper response to. And that just means responding to him. God will never give you what you refuse to give a proper response to. That means if you refuse to give a proper response to power, then God will never give you power. If you refuse to give a proper response to authority, God will never give you authority. Not for long. (laughs) Yeah, you'll get in there and you'll get right back out of there. Because your response determines what you're going to receive. Your response is going to determine how God is going to respond to you. So when your neighbor get blessed, how you respond to your neighbor being blessed determines how God is going to respond to you. If you can't handle your neighbor being blessed, then God is like, well, you can't handle your own blessing either. Oh, yeah. And this is scripture. This is, let's look at Luke 16, 11, uh, uh, Luke uh, uh, 16, 12. 
And he said, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give to you which is your own? Who going to give you your own stuff? If that's how you responded to your neighbor being blessed, who going to give you your own stuff? Because your, your, your response actually reveals your, your capacity to receive. Your response reveals your capacity to receive. Let me put it like this. When the farmer goes to lay seed in the ground, if the ground responds negatively, the sower going to take his seed and go somewhere else. He waiting to see how the soil going to respond. And God is the same way here. He waits to see how you're going to respond to determine what I'm going to give you next. I, I'm t All right, I'm going to prove it to you by scripture, amen. We're going to get into it. I want y'all to remember Moses in the burning bush. Moses is walking on the backside of the desert and he see a burning bush and he's like, oh my God, this is, I've never seen nothing like this. This is fire, no pun intended. <laughs> you know, he's looking at the burning bush and seeing that it's not consumed by the fire. Oh my goodness, this is a, this is a sight. And he goes and he turns to go, see, I got to go look closer. But look what the Bible says. It says, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. But notice, he didn't talk to Moses. If Moses would have kept walking, Moses would have never known. No, he would have never knew no different. Come on. But when Moses decided to respond to something that was, it was a burning bush, it wasn't natural. He decided to respond. He didn't try to treat what was amazing as if it was common. He decided to respond, and God spoke to him. He said, Moses, Moses. And this is important because a lot of times we think we're waiting on a response from God and God is waiting for you to respond. I'm still waiting on you to respond to the last thing I told you. You still ain't responded to the burning bush that I placed in your life. And you looking for a response from me? I'll wait. I'll wait till you respond. <laughs> God is like that. When Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples were, they were congregating together and they were talking. And the Bible says that Jesus drew near unto them, but he withheld their ability to understand that it was him. They withheld, he withheld their eyes. And so he began to walk along the way with them. And he began to tell them all things concerning himself. And he was like, oh, you fools, did y'all know that all of these things were supposed to happen to the Christ? Amen. And he was like, did our hearts not burn within us when he spoke to us? Our hearts was on fire when he was talking to us. And when Jesus got to their stop, the Bible says that Jesus acted as if he would go further. When he got to their stop, he pretended and made as if he would keep going. But he wanted to see how they was going to respond to what he'd been telling them. And they said, no, Jesus, stay with us. Stay with us. Stay, spend, spend the day. We, we need more of this. <laughs> we need more of this. And this is important because this is important because God want to see if you still love his word. When your favorite face is not attached to it. Do you still love my spirit? Do you really, are you here for the spirit of God when my, when my face is not attached to it? Amen. God want to know things like this. God want to see if it's real. And he wanted to see how they were, would respond to determine if he was going to give them something else. God is looking for a response. Amen. Here's another place. Here's another place. When Samuel was sleeping. I remember when, when, when the Lord came to Samuel, he said, Samuel. Uh -huh. And then he woke up and he said, he said, Eli, did you call me? He said, no, boy, go back to bed. Uh -huh. And he did it again. He was like, Eli, I thought I heard you call me. He's like, no, go back to bed. Then Eli perceived how God is. He was like, wait a minute. There's a, there's a spiritual principle that God is trying to teach you right now. Next time the Lord calls you, say, the, your servant is listening, Lord, speak. And next time the Lord called him, he said, your servant is listening, Lord. And then he came, he said, okay, now let me tell you what's about to happen in the earth. God is waiting for your response. Can I give you one more? Even in the beginning, even when we go to Genesis, God in the beginning, he said, hmm, it's not good that man should be alone. And he didn't, he didn't just feel this way in his heart. The Bible says he actually said it. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. He expressed his will. And he said, I'm going to make a help meet for Adam. And that help meet is not turkey meat. It's just to say some help. 
that's equivalent to his value, amen? Not above his value, not below his value, but equivalent to your value. That's in verse 18, but guess what he do in 19? He began to create. But he began to create all of the beasts of the field. And the Bible says he brought them to Adam to see. I want to see if he understands that the value that I placed inside of him is different from the value that's in them. I wonder if he believes me and he understands that I was going to give him something according to his value. Will he believe my word? Let me see. He said he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Now, anytime you name something, anytime you can name something, then you have to know its purpose and its value. I named this a table because that's what it, 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 it is something to place things on. You call it a screwdriver because it drives screws. You call it a hammer because you're going to, if you name it, it has something to do with its purpose. Uh -huh. And God wanted to see if Adam knew the value of what was in him or was he going to settle? Because some of us be settling for some monkeys. Some of us be settling for some snakes. Some of us be settling for some wolves in our life. And God want to know, do you understand the value that I placed inside of you? Are you going to settle? Because the verse after that, when the Bible says, and there was nothing found for Adam amongst all of those beasts, there was nobody equal to his value. And when he saw that Adam was able to understand his value, God caused Adam to enter into his rest. And then God himself began to provide something for Adam. Understand? He began to provide himself. Sometimes we got to learn to wait on God for some things. Amen? Don't settle in a rush, but respond to, I don't respond to your desires, respond to what God is doing. And then when he took Eve out and brought him to Adam, Adam was like, now this is bone of my bone. This is, this is flesh of my flesh. Now we talking. This is something equivalent to my value. God want to know these things. Hey, God. Hey, God. But God is looking for a response, y'all. And to not give God a truthful response is the same thing as a lie. When you refuse to give him an honest response, that's a lie. That makes you a liar. When you hide his glory and you steal his glory, that makes you a thief. You're a thief and a liar when you decide to dishonor. Say it, say it. You understand? Yes. And we are not a dishonorable people. This is not us. We destroy that. We rebuke that, that identity in the name of Jesus. We are honorable people. But a lot of times we try to seek to not give people their proper glory so that we can feel like they're on our level. And that's the spirit of pride. We just want to feel like we're on the same level, and that's not honorable, amen? We can't allow amazing things to simply just be common. We can't take extraordinary things and try to make them ordinary. We got to learn how to rejoice when we see our neighbor being blessed. We got to rejoice that, 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 man, the person next to us is blessed. Glory to God. Amen. Because for one moment of complacency, Uzzah lost his whole life when he forgot the value of what he was standing next to. Y'all remember the man who went to reach for the thing and he was struck? He lost it all just for not knowing the value of what he was standing next to. It's important, y'all. We got to be mindful to these things, especially when it comes to God's word. God is serious about this thing. And things that he's serious about, that's what I want to warn us about, them things so we can be fruitful as possible. Look at Malachi 2.2. Let's look at Malachi 2.2 real quick. And he says, if you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name. If you refuse to respond to my glory, if y'all gonna keep acting like this and refuse to respond to my glory, said the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. You don't have to worry about a witch doctor. I'm gonna do it myself. And he says, I will curse your blessing. Yea, I have cursed them already. He's saying, I'm gonna I'm turn the thing I meant to bless you into a curse to you. But why, God? Because you do not lay it to heart. You don't take these things seriously. You don't take my word seriously. And God, this is a serious thing. He's looking for a response for his word. We're going to look at one more. Ezekiel 33, 30. He says, son of man, your people talk about you in their houses and whisper about you at the doors. They say to each other, come on, let's go hear what the prophet tell us, what the prophet's going to tell us and what the Lord is saying. So my people come pretending to be sincere and they sit before you 
and they listen to your words, but they have no intention on doing what you say. Come on, come on. Their mouths are full of lustful words and their hearts seek only after profit, after money. He says, you are, a very enter you are very entertaining to them, like someone who sings love songs with a beautiful voice or plays fine music on an instrument. And he says, they hear what you say, but they don't act on it. God, God is following people home and watching to see how they respond to the word. And he go back to the son of man. He say, look, son of man, look what they're doing. Like I just went and they talking about, but they have no intention of applying what you say. Yes, yes. This is important to know that God thinks like this. Yeah, because it's going to correct the way we move. It may hurt at first, but it's going to start correcting the way we move, y'all. Amen. So how do we not become like that? How do we honor God? How do we honor? How do we actually apply this thing of honor? What does it look like? Huh? Tell us something. I believe the, the most potent expression of honor is to become one. It's oneness. The greatest honor that a woman can give to a man is to become one. The greatest honor that a man can give to his God is become one. Then that's God's desire. Jesus said, Father, I have taken what you've given me and I've given it to them so that they can be one as me and you are one. Yeah. So he desires us to be one. Come on. Is that right? Yes, man. He desires oneness. But what does that look like? How do we honor? How do we honor God? It looks like receiving his word and letting it take root in our heart yes, yes. and produce fruit in our lives. Let me tell you what it looks like. It's a, this is the picture. It looks like the soil receiving the seed from the sower and becoming one with the seed and producing fruit. That is how the soil honors the sower. He receives the seed and he produces fruit. This is how the master, this is how the servant honors his master. He receives what his master has invested into him and he causes it to prosper and he produces fruit and brings it back. Amen. Y'all remember the, 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 uh, the parable of the talents? Two of them was considered honorable because they gave a proper response. But one of them was considered evil because he didn't give no response. He gave them back what he, what he invested into the ground. It's a bad thing when you put a seed into the ground and you only get a seed back. <laughs> because you put so much sweat, time, effort, and for it to only give you a seed back, that's a waste of my time. Understand? And so the same thing with a child and a parent. The child takes what the parent gives and causes it to be fruitful in a way that benefits or honors its parents, all right? The wife as well. She takes what the husband brings in and she multiplies it and causes it to be fruitful, amen? Is that making sense? Well, what is this? That's a picture, but what does this look like practically? How do we do this thing practically, right? It looks like covering and giving nutrition, all right? It's like the husband takes his wife, he covers her, he waters her with the word, he gives her nutrients so that she can be fruitful, all right? But not only the husband towards the wife, but the wife towards the husband. Even while I'm preparing this message, my wife cooking and keep making sure the kid's not cutting up, making sure I got my little paperwork, because she's giving me the nutrients I need to be fruitful. All right. She's helping me to be fruitful towards God. Amen. Yeah. So did you know that you can even cover your leadership? Amen. You remember how, Mo how Aaron and, and, and Joshua held up the hand of Moses so that he could be fruitful in his purpose. It looks like covering, protecting and giving them what they need to be fruitful. That's honor. That's what it looks like practically. Amen. Does that make sense? So it's not only receiving what you need, but it's giving back what they need as well. It's the law of reciprocity. It's the law of oneness, amen? Because not only does the field receive nutrition from the people, but the people receive nutrition from the field, amen? It's the law of oneness. When we understand this thing, the devil can't block us from being fruitful, amen? 
The devil can't block us from being fruitful. But there will be no fruit if the soil never becomes one with the seed. You will never have fruit until the seed becomes one with the soil. God will only command the blessing where there is unity. This is his laws. Amen? Hey, God. You can never be fruitful if you haven't learned this rule of oneness. Because the way to tap into value is oneness. That's the way to tap into value. If you really want to receive the value of a book, you don't just judge it by its cover and think you got the true value out of it. That's not how you get the value from a book. You open, let the book be open before you. And then you peel back the layers and consume it quietly. Don't make your opinions until you have consumed the book, until what's in the book is in you, until, until you've become one with the book and you're able to produce what's in the book. Yeah. Amen? That's how you receive true value. It's oneness, is what I'm saying. Oneness is important because a house divided against itself cannot stand. A body divided against itself has no life. Division is not fruitful for us as a people. Hey, God, what if we learn this again as a Hebrew people, if we learn the law of oneness? On. Amen? Hey, God. But in order for the soil to become one with the seed, there's a step that has to happen. Has to happen. The soil has to open up, amen, and receive the seed. Sometimes the soil got to just move some things out the way to, to be able to receive the value that God is trying to give you in your life. Sometimes you're going to have to move some things out the way. You're going to have to make room for what you want to receive from God. Amen? you got to give a response to what you want to see grow in your life. If you want to see that thing grow, then respond to it. Amen? we got to respond to it because God is glorified when we bear much fruit. The Bible says in John 15, 8, he says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. Amen? But I want to tell you this. I want, this, I, want to, I want to give this caveat. Being one does not mean being identical. Okay? I want y'all to really understand that because sometimes we don't like to talk about this honoring thing because we feel like, well, I lose a sense of who I am if I honor properly. Mm -mm. Being one does not mean being identical. The seed does not become identical to the soil. They just become one. Amen. So that they can produce a whole different thing. It's a picture of the wife. The two become one in order to produce something that looks like both of them. Yeah, yeah. Understand what I'm saying? The hand is one with the foot, but they are not identical. Come on, man. All right. The hand is not the forearm. The hand connects to the forearm to give the body an extra advantage. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, Glory. Because it's not identical. And a lot of times we think, Joining and being one with Christ means Brandon just disappears and then Christ appears. It's not exactly it. Christ appears within Brandon. And I become a new creature, a new version of who I am. You understand? What I'm, there's still some Brandon in here. You understand? But there's also Christ in here. And there's a new version of Brandon. And there's a new expression of who God is through me. You understand? You can experience a new flavor of who God is. Through, through my brother here, yeah, through yeah, my brother here, yeah. through my sister over there. Yeah. They all hold a, a, an expression of Christ in their own way. Right. And so that's why we got to begin to get to know one another to find out, I want to see the Christ in you. Because God has given me, like we talked about last time, God has given me everything I need according to life and godliness. Uh -huh. And he's hid pieces of himself in each one of you. Yes, and we have to begin to become one and join together to get the maximum of, of what God is trying to give us. Amen. It's the power of oneness. But it does not mean identical. Amen. It's not identical. Let's look at some scriptures that corroborate with what I'm saying, because I like to bring scripture. I don't just like to say stuff. I like to back it up with word. Amen. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. The Bible is saying when you learn this law of oneness, when you allow me to abide in you, and then you abide in me, ah, you're going to bring forth uh, much fruit. 
Because apart from the vine, the branches can't bring forth no fruit on their own. Mm -hmm. It's in oneness that you bring forth fruit. It says in John 15, 4, it says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. So it's saying, I'm going to pour me into you and you pour you into me. It's two things becoming one. I don't know if you've ever seen the marriage where they take the black sand and the pink sand and they pour it. It's two different things mixing together till you can't tell them apart. That's what God wants to do with each one of us. He wants to intertwine himself so deeply in us that people can't tell the difference. Amen. This may not seem like it's helping right now, but let it take root. Don't even focus on understanding it too much. Just let it take root. Amen. And then over time, God is going to water that thing. And it's eventually going to pop from beneath the ground and reveal itself. That's how revelation works. Amen. So just give it time. Let it sit. And a little caveat, a little caveat. Not everything that takes root bears fruit immediately. Some things take time. Some seed take nine months. Some seeds take, some seeds take years to produce. You got to be patient, amen, and water that seed and give that seed time to grow. And not for only other people, but I want you to take that for yourself. Don't be hard on yourself sometimes. Because sometimes we beat ourselves up. And I don't want you to be hard. Give it time to bear fruit. It's going to come. Just let it take root and let God do his thing. It's the sower that waters the seed. The soil don't water itself. God caused the increase. Amen? Hey, God. But when the soil don't bear fruit, the workers are disappointed. The farmer is disappointed when there's no return. Amen? It's a, it's a horrible thing when you invest everything you have into a child, and then that child grow up, and then he leave you to die. Amen? Yes. You, 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 when, the, when there's no fruit, the people that work in the field eat of the field. So think about that. Everywhere you are, you got to produce some type of value because the people that put value into you they live off of the field that they work in. Amen. Yes, so you got to, in every situation where you're on the job, wherever you are, try to always bring value to the table. Yeah, yeah. Always try to bring some type of value. Yeah. Always try to bring that spirit of excellence like yeah. we talked about. Amen. Yeah. Glory. Glory. So we see, that, we see that God doesn't want us to be identical, but he wants us to be an extension of one another. Yeah. Not identical, but an extension. And we see that connection allows power to flow. He wants us to be an, God wants us to be an extension of his power. Now, an extension cord, when you plug it to the wall, it extends power wherever you need it, right? God wants us to be like that. He wants to bring heaven on earth. He wants to extend his power on earth. And when we align ourselves and plug ourselves into power by honor, God is going to be able to allow power to flow freely. Amen? When you connect it, power can flow freely through connection. Amen? Glory. But this is not only true, y'all. This is not only true for, for, for the church. This is a law that's even true in the world. You know, when people do an apprenticeship, they go and produce value in somebody's life to receive value. That's what an apprenticeship is about. Sometimes they're getting coffee, whatever it may be. They, 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 they provide value in somebody else's life so that they can receive value. But this is not a strange thing to the church either because we see that same concept with the men of the Bible, Joshua and Moses. That's a perfect example of oneness. Joshua got up under Moses and helped provide value for Moses, and then Moses provided value to him. We see the same thing with Samuel and Eli. We see the same thing with Elisha and Elijah. We see the same thing with the 12 disciples in Jesus. This is how God transfers power. He tell them, listen, Elijah, you tired? Okay, go find that little boy Elisha and let him follow you around. You understand? This is how God transfers power. Hey, God, I hope y'all, y'all hearing me on that? Hey, God. Because what if as a people, a people of God, we begin, we begin to return to honor, y'all. 
What if we, we really get this concept down and we learn to be an extension of one another? Not saying I'm the head, not saying I'm the body, but saying we are the body. Not speaking as in I am this, I am that, but we are. Amen. Not it's, it's I for you and you for I. All things in common. Amen. Hey, God, and why is this important? I just, we, gonna, we wrapping up, too. We're getting to the end. We, gonna, we don't have a long night, amen? But why is this important? Why is this important? Why is honor important? Because we have to think of this long term. If honor equals power, then dishonor equals powerlessness. So it would behoove the devil to make us a dishonorable people. It's in his best benefit to make us dishonorable, but we are not. Let the weak say, I am strong, amen? We ain't going to claim that, amen? Hey, God. So in instead of discrediting our places of power, we got to begin to build up our places of power. Because as we dishonor our leaders, dishonor ours, the world is honoring their own. Satan is not divided against Satan. I don't know what they told you. But Satan don't cast out Satan. They work together. If you see somebody casting out a devil, I'm it's not by the power of Satan because Satan don't cast out Satan. Yes, this yes. is what Jesus is saying. This That's ain't right. what I'm saying. That's right. And so as we begin to downgrade our leaders, the world is promoting their drug dealers. They promoting their rappers. Yes. They're they doing, they doing everything to be one. But we got to think about this long term because our children are watching this. Yes, All right. And so the children are our future. And they watching, this is what's honorable? Well, naturally, I want to be what's honorable. And so they gravitating to the world. We basically taking our arrows and shooting them at the ground. We taking our future and shooting it into the dirt. All because we have lost the ability to honor. We have lost the mindset, not the ability, but the mindset to honor. Amen? And this is bad because what happens when the fathers are missing from the home? When we've dishonored what it means to be a father so much that the fathers no longer stick around. What happens when we begin to dishonor the pastor so much that the, nobody want to fill that position? That's not an honorable position. And there's no more pastors around. What happens when we dishonor the teachers so much that nobody wants to be a teacher? Nobody that's honorable wants to be a teacher no more. Amen? What happens when you pick up the phone and there's no, there's no police officer to call no more? Because we've, we've dishonored the places of power that God had put. He's placed them to protect us. The Bible says all power comes from God. He's ordained these offices to punish the wicked and give praise to them that do well, the Bible says. So he, uh, he ordained these things. So when you begin to tear down your places of power, where, will, where is your defense, Israel? They've made you tear it down by your own hands. So who going to defend you? I told you, it behooves the devil to make us a dishonorable people. So we got we to gotta return to this thing called honor. Yes. We got to return to this thing called honor, amen? So this is why we've been teaching on it so heavy, and we, we, we wrapping up. We can get the band to come, amen, because we, we, we get a word and we get out the way, amen? Amen. And so it behooves us, amen, glory. In 1 Timothy 2, it says, Pray for your kings and all those in authority that, it may, that we may live a peaceable life, a peaceable and quiet life. So he's saying, honor your places of leadership because it's beneficial to you. Amen? So the goal is not to destroy our places of power, but to reclaim them. So what is going to be our response as a people to the burning bushes in our life? What's going to be your response? Have you responded to the burning bushes that God has placed in your life? Have you responded to the value that God has placed in your life? What is your response? Because one day God is going to come back and he's going to be like, what did you do with my investment? What did you do with my seed? I planted, I've put so many things in your life. Have you responded to them? Will we be found faithful when he returns? Because it's like the parable with the talents. The Lord is coming back and he expects a return on his investment. That parable was told by Jesus, and he was giving them a highlight on what he planned on doing yeah. in the last days. 
He's going to say, what did you do with my seed? Amen. What was your response? And so if y'all want to, if there's anybody in the house, I'd like to take the, the opportunity to, to walk y'all through the gospel because if there's anybody in the house that want to receive what God has invested into the earth, and he's invested into our life through his son Jesus when he died on the cross for our benefit, for our benefit, amen. I want you to pray with me. Say, Lord, I receive what you have done on that cross. I believe that you died and you rose for my benefit. And I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. God, I respond to your glory, Father. I receive your goodness, Father. Give me a new heart. Correct the soil of my heart. Renew my mind, God, and cause me to produce fruit. Water this seed in my heart, God. In Jesus' name. And I want to send you all off with this scripture. In John 1, 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. To those that received them, those that received him, to them he gave power to. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. There you go. All right, y'all. Got y'all out of here quick tonight. Amen. Glory. Glory.